tonight. It can compose music, write university assignments and even track terrorists. But if artificial intelligence becomes smarter than us, where does that leave the human race? Tonight, we put your questions to our experts. Physicist Brian Green says AI brings risks and rewards. Cathy Foley is Australia's chief scientist. Retired Army General Gus McLaughlin advises on cyber and AI warfare. Jesse Stevens on the consequences for creatives. And entrepreneur Nadia Lee hunts the deep fakes threatening our democracies. Welcome to Q&A. Hello, I'm Patricia Carvellis. I want to pay my respects to the Gadigal people of the Eora Nation on whose land we are meeting. Remember, you can live stream us around the country on iView and all the socials. Quandra is the hashtag. Please get involved. To get us started tonight, here's a question from Jenny Carroll. Does the panel agree that AI could be the next form of evolution after Homo sapiens? And what does the panel think of the philosophy that humans have unwittingly engineered their own extinction? Brian. <laughs> Very simple question, so thank you for asking. We thought we'd um, start easy you know, I, I would say it probably a little bit differently. I would say that for all of human history, we've known that the way that we access the world is through these feeble senses and through this thing inside of our head that processes the incoming data. We don't actually see the external world for real. We process it through these things that have come to us through evolution. What AI gives us is the possibility of seeing the world in a very different way. AI doesn't process the world through eyes and ears and through a brain. It does it through a completely different system. And what's exciting to me is that we may learn things about reality that we have no idea of, that we could never be sensitive to because of the limitations of our biological form given to us by evolution. So that, to me, is where AI can take us. And extinction? Can it take us to extinction? Anything can take us to extinction. Can, this, can this particularly take us to extinction, which was the centre of the question? It's a real worry. But I would not let that stop us. We have to have the guardrails in place. No doubt we'll talk about that. But the opportunities are so enormous that we can't let the fear mongers win on this one. We have to be careful. We have to have guardrails. But we have to go forward. OK. Cathy Foley. Well, I'm really worried about extinction if we don't get climate change under control. Mm. So that's something which is the first thing if you're worrying about extinction. So that's a really good question. But I think we need to recognise that uh, we've got big problems, that we have to use every tool in our toolbox, and AI is a pathway of doing that. One of the things it is doing already is uh, helping us be able to detect cancer better. Uh, it's able to allow us to uh, absorb l very large amounts of data and be able to get some sense out of it. And they're just two examples. We're, we'll be seeing the opportunities that AI bring to us as humans as something which really make a big difference to us. I've also got to remember that AI is a set of computer programs. It's not sentient, it's not magic. It's, uh, it's software that's looking at statistics that goes back and looks at all the data that's, uh, at its, at, 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 that's available to it and then be able to bring out some information based sure, on Kathy, what we Sure, as for. it is now. But what happens if it gets smarter than us? Well, it's up to us to design things in a way where we have, as Brian was saying, guardrails that say this is where we are agreeing on something and where we don't agree. I mean, we've done this all the way through humanity. When we uh, developed our nuclear weapons, chemical weapons, biological weapons, we cre created treaties that said around the world, this is how we will operate. Jesse, is it freaking you out slightly? It's freaking me out because I'm listening to the people who are creating it and they're saying it's freaking them out. So they're sort of going, we don't know what this can do. Sometimes we don't fully know how it works. And when I'm hearing them say that this has the potential to, I think I heard Sam Altman say, um, switch the lights off of humanity, that makes me a little bit worried. And I agree that it needs guardrails, but what worries me is that when there's capitalist incentives 
for AI and we're in a bit of an arms race, that when does this stop? Are we deploying technologies that we don't fully understand that could have terrible consequences and in the hands of the wrong people, you know, if it's the bad guys have it, the bad guys can do bad things. And that's the big question. Cathy, I'll let well, you Well, one in. thing which actually you have to remember is it uses a lot of energy. Mm. And uh, one of the things which, if anything, if uh, you can pull the plug out, but also there's a prediction that we will uh, use up so much energy with doing AI that we actually won't have enough energy in general. So mm. I think that's going to be one of the limiting factors. Yeah, that right. uh, you, you just can't let things grow forever. And if you have good guys with AI, and you have to hope that the good guys are smarter than the bad guys, because the bad guys are usually bad because they're not as smart as the good guys. They can't make it in the ordinary yeah. way. Mm -hmm. So if you got the good guys with the AI, there's a real opportunity for them to That's construct true. the AI to combat the very things that people are genuinely and mm, okay. legitimately concerned about. All right, that's quite a binary way of looking at it, right? There's <laughs> the good guys and the bad guys, and I, look, I like, I like it, I like it, I like it. It seems easy, but I don't <laughs> think it works like that, does it? Um, well, perhaps my background makes me a little bit, um, perhaps more wary. Um, I completely agree we can't ignore it. It's like ignoring the tide coming in, so I think we have to yeah. embrace it, we have to put guardrails mm -hmm. on it, we have to develop it, but other less um, uh, ethical uh, individuals, leaders, countries will will choose to progress whether we like it or not. Mm. I'm a bit of a science nerd. I apologise, and 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 there's a. <laughs> I, there's I a, can't a good figure thing. out how you got invited onto the show. <laughs> a, a particular particular event. Um, uh, machines started beating humans in the chess game in, in the late 80s. Um, chess relatively bounded game, finite number of moves. There's an Asian strategy game called Go, and hugely popular in South Korea, China, and Japan. And uh, a team of, of AI researchers challenged the Go world champion in 2016. And, and I think this will become kind of anthropologically one of the most interesting things in AI development. The, the world champion they, they, they challenged Lee Sedong was the Roger Federer of, of Go. He had won 18 world championships in a row. He was arrogant and dismissive of the computer because he said, it, this is a game of, of judgment. There's no set moves, you know, two up, one left. It's a game of judgment. And the computer beat him easily in the first game. But people said, oh, well, he was taking it lightly. In the second game, he was uh, leading and the commentators were all comfortable that he's righted the ship and, and the human will prevail. There's a famous move. I think it's move 37. Pro pro forgive the geekiness. <laughs> but the computer plays a move that so shocks Lee Sedong that he sort of pushes his chair back and uh, it's interrogated later, and the machine says this was the move I assessed would most shock the human player. Mm -hmm. Now, that's starting to make me nervous. Mm -hmm. So, uh, as we move toward general intelligence, the machines will find ways to shock us uh, and, and find us uh, in, in our areas of weakness. So, so, yes, we've got to develop it, guardrails. Mm. I think the idea of pulling the plug in those data centres, we, we need to build okay. a, a really easy plug. Nadia, mm. isn't it the case that the AI is going to be so smart that when it realises we're about to pull the plug, it's going to outsmart us? I don't know. I have to... Um, maybe I'll say something controversial, um, but I don't think AI is going to be the extinction or evolution of the human race. Um, the it's reason... not controversial. But... <laughs> it's the perspective. Um, and even though I'm an ethical AI advocate, I'm, I'm pretty... I think it's going to bring amazing things to human race. Um, and I think we have to make a distinction between what is malicious and non-malicious. So we have to regulate the people, not the technology. And also, if you look at any piece of, like, important piece of technology that's been developed, it's always amplified a, a part of the human race. So, for example, like social media, it's made us more sensitive to how, what people think of us and how people perceive us. But there was always a part of who we were. And maybe AI will amplify other aspects of us. For example, like productivity, but in both good and bad ways. Creativity, both good and bad ways. And so I think it will amplify um, us in ways that we, want, we might not expect. Um, but we do, I think we are in the sweet spot now where we can get, we, we don't have to be as late as we were to social media when it mm -hmm. comes to AI. We are in a place that we can control it and then mm -hmm. we can have a discussions to uh, put the right guardrails in place. And that gets us to our the topic of our online poll. We're asking you, the US could pass laws that would ban TikTok if its Chinese owner doesn't divest. Should we follow suit? You can cast your votes anonymously on the Q&A Facebook and YouTube accounts or the ABC News X and Instagram accounts.
and we'll bring you the results later. Next, we'll hear from Pip Bell. If the ABC ran a Q&A program with a deep fake panel and a deep fake not really live audience, would the people watching at home notice anything different? Mm. <laughs> no. <Jeez. laughs> would there be a deep fake host no. too? <laughs> Um, no? No is the um, answer. Um, thanks for that question. It's very important. So what topic. is deepfake, just for the viewers who aren't across it? So deepfake is the ability to take somebody's face, um, that data, and replicate it um, in artificially generated media. And uh, um, recently, I'm sure that the panellists and everybody is aware of OpenAI's release of Sora, um, and that's basically the ChatGPT version of... Um, video, uh, the video version of ChatGPT. And what you're able to do is put in a prompt and it will spit out something that is actually remarkably lifelike. So, yes, there are some nuances where it looks like, oh, yeah, there's a bull in that noodle shop or it's kind of weird, but it's in the background. It's very convincing. So I think it's, it's definitely the case that if we have a deep fake panel and a deep fake host, you won't be able to notice a difference. Mm. But... I think when it comes to deepfakes, the more important question is distinguishing between good deepfakes and bad deepfakes. What's the difference? So the difference is, let's say I used Sora, right, and recreated a beautiful memory I have with my grandmother who passed away, and I decide to upload it on YouTube and make it publicly available. Do we need to detect that and pull that down? I don't know. I don't think so. The problem is when my face is on a malicious piece of content. So let's say it's a deep fake porn or it's a deep fake um, financial extortion scheme or whatever else. That's where the problem is. So I think what we have to focus on is de deciding as a society and for the regulators to define what is malicious, what are the priorities of what is worse and what is better, and how do we detect and mitigate it and moderate it. That's Can really I ask, though, on mm. that one, if I come across your YouTube video uh -huh. and I go, well, that looks real, that's a real memory, and mm. then I learn that it isn't, is that not eroding my trust in everything that I see? Like, that's what I'm sort of mm. worried about, is even the Kate Middleton example that's come mm. out, we don't know whether that was AI, but... Mm. But it was a doc just for those, <laughs> I don't know how you missed this story. <laughs> but if you're the one person in the world that did, let us help you, a doctored picture of Kate Middleton... Princess of Wales mm. with her three children at a time where she's not publicly available. Mm. Yes. Right? And the image has been found by, you know, Reuters, by Getty. Mm. They've all said, kill notice, get this down. This mm. has been tinkered with mm. in a way that we don't want you to distribute it as mm. news. Mm. So what that does is I then start going, well, I don't trust institutions. I don't trust yeah. what the monarchy tell me. I don't mm. trust what the news is saying. We've got war going on and it's popping mm. up and I'm seeing this video and I can just go... I don't believe that's happening unless it's right in front of me. Mm. Is that an issue? That, mm. that if we do start to incorporate deep fakes into things mm. that we're seeing, we've got in Israel, there are um, uh, news readers who have basically licensed their image and mm. you can make them say whatever they want. Yeah. My voice can be licensed in a podcast and I can say whatever. Is, so, is that a worry? Yeah, so I'm really lucky to be um, connected with the, um, some heavyweights in trust and safety kind of globally in like China and US, whatever. And the ringing, the general consensus is that nobody knows, there isn't a global standard or understanding of what even is malicious, mm. what is the priority, do we deal with like CSAM first and then do we go to NCI, sorry for the smart lingo, <laughs> weird lingo, um, but what is the priority? And so in that case, for the Kate Middleton example, then do we put in the erosion of public institutions as a priority? then mm. do all of the doctored images, any doctored image of any public figure, go into the bucket of content that needs to be detected mm. and moderated. So that we need to decide. So, mm. Brian Green, we've got a couple of really big elections this year. Mm. Really? really? Big one in the United <laughs> States you might be across. Yes. Um, mm. It's been dubbed as the first big AI election. Is that how you see it? And what are the risks with deepfakes? Well, obviously, it's, it's really scary. So mm. the question that you raise is a big one because, yes, there is already distrust of what we mm. see. Mm. And, you know, however wonderful your software may be, I mm. do wonder mm. if 
in the not too distant future, the vast majority of the content online will not be trustworthy. I mean, think about content online, it grows exponentially, which means most of it at any given moment of time was only just recently posted, mm -hmm. which means now with these tools where anybody will be able to create deep fakes, the vast majority of what's out there will be fake. Mm -hmm. So what will likely happen is mm -hmm. you'll stop trusting everything mm -hmm. that you see mm -hmm. online. Mm -hmm. And that will take us back potentially to an old way of assessing the world where you have mm -hmm. trusted sources. Mm -hmm. You don't trust anything if it doesn't come from a source that you trust. Mm -hmm. Who do I trust? I mean, I trust the New York Times. Mm -hmm. I trust CNN. I mean, there are places where there are things called journalists mm -hmm. who actually spend their life trying to figure out what's true and what's not. Mm -hmm. And I think we may be forced back into a realm where you don't just look online mm -hmm. and what you see is real. Mm -hmm. You look online and you distrust everything. What you see is not real mm -hmm. unless it comes from okay. a trusted source. That sounds like it might be the best case scenario, though, that people go back to institutions. I want to bring in um, a guest in our audience tonight um, who is really at the centre of a lot of these issues. I want to bring in Professor David Blunt. Um, I know you've been following this closely, David. You've heard the conversations around trust mm. and ethics. Yeah. What are your reflections? Uh, it's a really interesting conversation. I mean, the first thing that I'll say, you know, with regards to deepfakes, I mean, this is something that has been going on for a very long time. You know, there is a very famous picture of Nikita Khrushchev in the, white, or in the United Nations banging his shoe on the table. That's a fake picture. He never did it. Uh, but people will say that they've seen a real picture. So this is an escalation of behavior that's already existed. Mm. Now, what I find fascinating about the discussion in AI is that we think about what it will do to us. You know, we heard, will it destroy humanity? Uh, will we have to pull the plug? Uh, but we don't think about what we owe to it. Uh, this is the first time we have a technology that has the potential to become self-aware, to have a moral personality. Steam engines didn't do that. Nuclear weapons didn't do that. Artificial intelligence may do that. So are we going to one day wake up and the singularity will happen and artificial intelligence come online? And are we going to sort of be like the uh, Lilliputians in Gulliver's Travels, uh, trying to tie it down? Are we actually going to try to think about what we owe it? Because it is, in many ways, our child. How do, what do we owe artificial intelligence? How do we make it live in a better ethical world? Because I'm more worried about human beings than I am about AI. Well, human beings created the AI, right? Mm. So is AI not a reflection of the imperfect humans that made it? Yeah, I mean, we can say that, you know, nothing sort of straight can be made out of the twisted timber of humanity. Uh, but, you know, we still have children, right? We still bring new human beings into this world and we don't despair of them. We hope that they'll do better, right? The young people in the audience tonight, we hope they will do better than us. That they will rise to the challenge of things like climate change. We should think of the same things when we think about artificial intelligence. How will we give it the best start in life? That's producing guardrails not just for AI, but for people and how we use AI, how we shape AI to ensure that it doesn't have all of the bad things that we have, the racism, the sexism, the misogyny. We want to get rid of that in artificial intelligence. And that is a task that we've never faced with something like a steam engine or uh, an aeroplane. That's a novel challenge for us. That's really interesting, Professor David Blunt there. He is a fellow at the Ethics Centre here in Sydney. Cathy Foley. Um, OK, designing AI not to have all of these prejudices. So far, how are we going with that? Uh, I think we're not I mean, quite there yet. it's a great idea. <laughs> How's it going? Look, one of the things is that at the moment it's very biased. So if you look at uh, where AI is often used in a blind way, such as uh, going through uh, looking at a whole lot of applications for a job and it goes through and screens things where a certain group of people just aren't included because they don't fit whatever is the algorithm that's being used. There's lots of examples where uh, it shows extraordinary bias from whether it's gender, um, cultural and so on. And, uh, and that's because a lot of the work and the development is being done by a very narrow group of population, usually people who are males in, uh, in, in, in Silicon Valley. And so if we are having a limited group of people actually looking at developing this technology, we're going to have a very limited technology that comes from that. So what we need to be doing is making sure that the development of technology brings in the full human potential so that we get a bit of everything in there and hopefully live up to that opportunity. I'm troubled by who, who is the checker. Um, we have this wonderful institution in Australia called the Australian Electoral Commission and they've got a mandated responsibility to run free and fair elections. But do they check whether uh, an AI 
uh, post is accurate, is that the job of a government, um, you know, them, are we in the kind of information mm -hmm. control sphere? We've got great universities that can be doing some of that work. So as we move forward as a society, we're going to have to work out, you know, who is starting to keep an eye on these things. I think this notion of convergence of technology, AI of itself is relatively harmless. AI linked to social media penetrates every bedroom in this country, on this planet probably. So I, I think they're the sort of questions we've got to keep working on. Who polices the process? The one thing I, I would say is a very interesting question that you raise, but it does assume that the capacities of the AI system are comparable to ours or at least within the same universe as ours. But as AI increases its computational power by a factor of a thousand, ten thousand, a million, a billion, I think we'll be dealing with something where our experience for the last 200,000 years as a species will just be completely irrelevant. It will just be in a different universe of processing power and a different universe of conceptions and ideas. So I agree that we should try to root out the parts of humanity that we find ugly and, 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 and things that we don't value, but I think the AI is likely to go to a place that we can't even comprehend. The problem is some people value what you value and other people yes, value I agree. something yeah, exactly. else. I agree. So how you it actually very get agreement on that is yeah. going to be tough. We'll keep this discussion going with a question from William Otto. Thank you. Um, while science calls for caution on nuclear energy, louder voices say stop all mining of fossil fuels now. The counter-argument warns of dire consequences to whales and weekends if we introduce renewables. How can we overcome the entrenched positions in the energy debate and work out the best way forward? It's a great question. At the, at the heart of really of, the, of your question, I think, is the nuclear issue. Mm. Dr Foley, should we be looking at nuclear in Australia as we're having this debate about renewables? Well, at the moment, uh, nuclear isn't an option for Australia because legally it's not um, not something that's possible. OK, so if that was to change, is it economic, is it a good idea? Well, if you look at the um, the reports that have been done, it's an expensive technology and it's one where it would take some time to build up the capability to do that in Australia. It is a technology that's used in some countries and it's one where... Um, where it is able to provide uh, energy where we don't, you know, they don't have wind and they don't have um, solar... Uh, energy. So, uh, so that makes sense. But for Australia, we've got the potential to have renewables based on, um, on solar panels and wind and batteries. And that's a pathway that the government's been um, putting forward and is on uh, you know, a plan to get there by uh, getting to zero emissions at the, uh, 2050. So. Well, the opposition is saying, as you know, that we should remove the restriction and let nuclear compete. Do you think we should? <coughs> Well, you know, as Chief Scientist, it's not for me to actually say what the government should do. What we should be doing is looking at uh, the evidence and the information that, that is available and make sure that we make good decisions based on all the different things we have to take into and account. And is it your sense that nuclear shouldn't be on the table? I don't think we should be making that decision without actually getting the information that's needed to be able to Do you think we need more or is there enough? So at the moment the plan is to be able to get to zero emissions using renewables and, uh, and batteries and so Australia's got a fantastic situation where we have so much, uh, so much uh, energy from wind and, and solar that we should be making the most of that. Brian, how do you, I mean, this is very much a domestic debate. I know other countries have, have nuclear energy, but no doubt you know we're having this debate in our own country. Do you think it's an option we should be looking at? Look, you know, if you're talking abstractly about nuclear power, I think it's a wonderful energy source. If you're talking about the practicalities of the time scale and the cost, are. those are details that I it's above my pay grade, and I'll defer to the chief scientist. <laughs> you know, but you know, if we talk about mid-century, I think mid-century and beyond, I think there's a good chance that we have fusion as opposed to fission. And once that's on the table, everything changes. No. That will be the approach that will take over, say, from 2050, 2060 onward. How does it onward. change? How does it cha Describe to people who, are, who don't know what you're talking about, what you're talking about. Well, well when you talk <laughs> about <laughs> nuclear power as of today, I presume you're talking about fission, fission. Yeah, where you're taking is. large atoms, basically, you're splitting them yep. apart, and sort of like snapping of rubber bands, when these large atoms split, energy is released. 
We all know that the downside of this is you have radioactive waste, you've got meltdown problems. I mean, there's some real issues that are quite dangerous. Fusion is what powers the sun. You take light atoms like helium and you meld them together. And in that melding process, energy is released. And that energy doesn't yield any radioactive waste as the product. It's much more difficult to undertake fusion, but there is now tremendous progress. And I think many people in the field really do think it's realistic to imagine that by 2050, 2060, this may be a technology that we harness. Imagine having little suns all over the planet that are used to create clean sources of energy from the most ubiquitous atoms around. You know, hydrogen. I mean, God, how wonderful would that be? You've sold it to me. Uh, <laughs> Gus, I mean, we are um, obviously in this AUKUS agreement on nuclear submarines. Mm. We've agreed to that. Uh, just talk me through the practicalities of that, though, because there are some difficulties in yeah. getting there. Look, I, 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 there's, a, there's this issue of social licence, right? We, the, the, the people of, of Australia, have got to agree to a particular technology, and up until now... New, nuclear technology has been something that has been excluded, including specific direction to the military not to make recommendations to government about nuclear-capable submarines. Now, that changed, uh, and, and I'm, I'm, I'm told one of the fundamental changes is a, is a change in technology where this nuclear reactor is smaller, it's enclosed, and it stays enclosed for the life of its service. Um, that, that appears to have made politicians more comfortable that we'll be able to operate these things. Now, I think there's a moral dimension. Whether we like it or not, there's still waste produced by that sealed device, and I think part of the agreement with the United States is we will take mm. our share of waste back. We're going to have to, we're going to, have to create that social licence with a community somewhere in Australia to put that waste. And, by the way, we have tonnes of waste, you know, sitting in temporary storage around now because we can't get kind of past this, um, this issue... So it looks like we're going to have a, a nuclear-powered submarine. Um, there's probably another view that if we hold our breath a little bit, um, th that may not eventuate. Um, but, but let's say it does. We've got one will probably be based, or some will probably be based in Perth, and the others we're hearing will be down here at Port Kembla, quite close to Sydney. And so there's a community down there that have got to get their head around the fact that there's going to be this, uh, you know, this and, very complex And system. given they've got to get their head around that, can you see them... Like, if we haven't even got there yet, can you see people getting their hand around nuclear? Well, it comes to leadership. From, from my perspective, we, we've got to explain to people the value proposition. Um, I personally believe submarines are a very important part of deterring aggression toward Australia. Nuclear submarines are very capable. They can stay submerged for three months mm. at a time, which makes them, you know, quite a, a, an important capability. Again, there's arguments that there are technologies that will be in space within 50 years that will be able to detect large steel objects through the through the water. So well, these are all the sort of things that when we're making defence policy, we have to think ahead. But, but it's now up to our leaders to make the convincing case to the people of Australia that, A, we need them, we're going to be good stewards of them, and we will take our share of the full cycle. I don't think all of that's been done OK, yet. just quickly before we get to our next mm. question, I heard a little bit of apprehension about what, whether you think AUKUS and those submarines will arrive here? Are you a bit worried about it? We've got news uh, just this week that uh, the, the, the American uh, budget process is unable to sustain the, 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 the building of their own yep. submarines. So They've we, slashed in half their own production. Yeah, so I think we need to, the Americans need to be building something like 2.3 a year to fit ours into the production run. They're budgeted for one per year. So th there are clearly some roadblocks. Now, th there are great people working on this. By the way, a very significant sovereign wealth transfer of money is about to take place. I think we're putting $6 billion into that production system imminently in, you know, in this next budget cycle. So we're paying into that system to, to boost the production capability. Um, so this is, we're on this enterprise. It started. Um, I'm not yet fully convinced we've had the national debate or the discussion to, to get everybody pulling in the same direction. OK. I'd like to bring in Stuart Lung. Thank you, Patricia. Good evening, panel. How can AI be utilised to ensure our defence force is sufficiently resourced to defend our sovereign interests, especially given current geopolitical tensions? Well, that's an obvious one for you, Gus. Back to me. <laughs> um, so, uh, great question, because we're a very small military. By regional standards, uh, we're tiny. So the question is, how does a very small defence force achieve advantage? You, 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 traditionally, you can have mass or size. 
you can have huge technological advantage or, but the Australian government, two governments in a row now have said, we will have decision superiority, meaning we'll know exactly where our uh, forces are in space and time, we'll know exactly where our adversary is, and that will allow us to make better decisions. AI has an incredibly important, important role in that. So even though my misgivings about Move, move 37, um, we're not going to be able to do what we need to do. Traditionally, generals have always wanted to know what's over the hill. Well, we know everything that's over the hill now. In fact, we've got generals drowning in information. So the AI is being, will come into our control systems to help us sort through that. Now, is there bias in that? Is it, is it, is it weighted towards a particular... All of those things we will need to discover. But that will allow us, in theory, to, to be a tougher nut to provide more deterrence. Brian, do, will we need a whole lot fewer soldiers as a result of AI having roles in our militaries? I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> I don't think I've ever heard you say that. No, on occasion I do. You do? Yes, yes. Like, I thought I had yeah. world When first. I truly have nothing to say on the matter. So I'll defer to people who actually know something. Mm. So, so, Patricia, we, we've always had robots. Uh, if you wanted to sort of blow up a, an explosive device, you sent a robot forward. We will have AI, in, you know, become join those robots and that will take soldiers out of the dangerous, dirty jobs. I, I sadly... I uh, served in Afghanistan and lost two wonderful young Australian uh, men to uh, improvised explosive devices. So if I can put a robot through a crossing and have that area cleared, I'll take that option every time. But there's a huge ethical dimension. What about when we put an automatic cannon or a future laser on that autonomous system mm -hmm. and we tell them that anyone with a particular face or carrying a particular mobile phone is the enemy and, and can therefore yes. be mm -hmm. destroyed. Now, I, I reassure you all that the Australian government is moving quite slowly on this. I actually think too slowly. We don't have a single armed drone in our inventory and that's predominantly because of this issue. We're grappling, our policy makers are grappling with how on earth do you do this and give the approvals in an appropriate way? The question is how long we can have that debate before you know, we fall behind. Can we turn it just all into simulated warfare? <laughs> and then, to answer your question, I have to jump in with a real answer. Maybe Please. you have, maybe have no soldiers mm. and you just pit yeah. your AI yeah. system yeah. against the other AI system and let them fight it out, this, and whoever wins, wins. This would be a really good solution to a couple of wars we're having. There it is. <laughs> sort, yeah. sort it out that way. Yeah. I wouldn't mind bringing you back in, though, <laughs> David Blunt, as an ethicist, yeah, on that question of warfare, where these ethical decisions mm. are really key in the theatre of war. Yeah, look, it's a really complex discussion. But one thing I'll say, as far as I know, AI has never committed genocide. It's never committed ethnic cleansing. It's never killed civilians. Uh, these are things that it might do in the future, depending on how we program it. But we know people do this, right? One of the things that AI can provide that I'm interested in, someone who's interested in the ethics of war, is the constraints that it will put on arms platforms, right? It will prevent civilian casualties. It will be restraints where human beings often wind up making terrible and atrocious decisions that kill innocent people. If we have AI coded so that it compels or complies with the laws of war, the ethics of war, then we might be able to avoid things like massacres. Mm. We might ensure that things like the Geneva Conventions are respected because they'll be built in to these platforms. If they're indeed built in, because if that's they're built the in. thing. And right. that's the discussion that needs to be had, right? And in terms of where these discussions can be had in Australia, you know, right now the Ethics Centre, who I'm associated with, really is pushing for the uh, Australian Institute for Applied Ethics, where we can have a centre where we can think about these issues that all of us are going to have to deal with in the future. Because if we don't take a lead in this, we're going to be taking other people's leads. Mm. We either be rule makers or rule takers. That's a choice we're looking at now. Excellent point, David. Thank you. If you're just joining us, you're watching Q&A Live with Nadia Lee, Gus McLaughlin, Brian Green, Kathy Foley and Jesse Stevens. There is a lot to get to tonight. Here's Claire Doran. Um, my daughter takes violin lessons because people will always want to see humans playing instruments in an orchestra, in my opinion, not robots. Do you think orchestras will become more popular as people want to see a performance? The little imperfections in a human orchestra are what gives the music its feel or presence. Playing violin or cello or other instruments may be one of the few employment options for humans in the future, which could be a very good thing. We can let the AIs do all the nasty stuff. <laughs> do you agree with us, with this? 
Go, I want to start with you, if we can. That's a really po interesting yeah. point. I really hope so. That would be great. My uh, friend who works in the music industry would have a very different answer that would be very depressing, I think, about um, how every jingle, the way that musicians were making their money five minutes ago, is now being done by AI. But I do keep hearing with these, you know, with ChatGPT, it's like it can free us up to be creative. I don't know what we think we're going to do with all the time we have because ChatGPT, so it's meant to synthesise all our information, apparently it can write a novel, it can write a screenplay. Like, what else are we doing that, that we can suddenly... We're, maybe we can learn to play the violin or something. And what I love about your question is that it speaks to the imperfection inherent in our art. Unfortunately, um, ChatGPT does imp imperfection very well as well in that it's just bad sometimes. <laughs> um, but I would hope that as someone who, you know, has written books, has written fiction, um, that that is something humans still have hold over because I'm thinking, you know, maybe you can get AI to, to write a song, but Taylor Swift recently in Australia, that was an embodied... In, intensely human experience. That's why we we enjoy music. And so there are some things that I think humans still have control over and do better than the robots. So an <laughs> AI Taylor Swift on that stage wouldn't have quite got there, right? Look, I don't think so. I, I, I'm not 100% sure, to be honest. And the fact that they can go, you know, write a Taylor Swift, Taylor Swift next song and it probably wouldn't be bad is a little worrying. But... I think people like to see the real thing. They like to see the stumbles and the the way that, you know, humans make make errors. It's what it's what makes. So us... you've written a book. You've got a lot of books in you. I can feel it. <laughs> I'm right. I'm, it's, it's a fair assumption. Mm -hmm. Yes. I feel like there's going to be a lot of books from you. <laughs> yeah. Does it worry you? Yeah, because even my my last book, I was grappling with it. That was fiction, and I went, I think ChatGPT could have written this. Because what what do you do? when you sit down to write a book, right? You read everything in the genre and then you sort of spit out whatever comes. Mm -hmm. And I went, maybe ChatGPT, if, if it could draw on all of human knowledge. I mean, sitting on this panel, it would do such a better job than me because it would know no. about nuclear. <laughs> it would know about all the nuclear things because it would have all the information. But Jessie is a limited human being who doesn't have access to that. Is very silly about it. <laughs> but I did think with the book, I went, I don't know if, if it is... I mean, on, on the other hand, I go, AI can't... It can't suffer. It doesn't have loss. It can't walk down the street and have an, an, a fresh, original thought. It can't interact with the world like we do. But it can draw on every human who ever did. So that does genuinely worry me. OK, it can't do all of those things yet. Yeah. But Sorry. <laughs> It's, yeah, it I might know. be able to. Um, it definitely can. Uh, it definitely can. Cool. But I think I don't know. Oh, cool. <laughs> cool. Um, but Feeling I think, okay about that? <laughs> no. I don't know. But I, I, I'm really optimistic about this. So I think humans have been creative our entire lives. So we have not only been good at it, being mathematically creative or artistically creative or writing something or building something, but we have derived real joy and pleasure from it. So I don't think just because there's an AI that can do it um, just as well as we can, it's going to be the death of all of those things. I think it will survive and we will still derive value from it. But I think in the realm of creativity, there is a really interesting question that surfaces, which is, what is inspiration and what is infringement? Mm. So if AI looks at my poem that I've posted and uses it to train its data, and spits out something that's really, really great. Is that infringement on my data or is it inspiration? And if it is infringement, how do we even start to mark what, who owns what and detect and moderate and, and run that whole system? Mm -hmm. um, so that's a really interesting question. Claire, I'm getting the sense that you're actually quite optimistic about AI. Mm. You because are. I think if people like Putin had access, had access to AI, he might have become a conductor instead of a megalomaniac. <laughs> and he could take it out in the orchestra. Right. Uh, just mm. such a different perspective, which I think is great to hear, right? Well, the other thing is, I, I think there's a lot of us versus them yeah, here exactly. tonight. Mm. It's like the humans versus the AI. Mm. Are they going to kill us? Or are we, what mm. do we owe them? 
<laughs> I think the real future, or at least a brighter future, is it's us and mm. them. Mm. And so we can meld with the AI systems in order to be able to do the things that we couldn't do alone. Mm. Mm. And we can inject what we can provide, and the AI can inject what it can provide, mm. and we can enter a realm where we create things that we could never have imagined. Mm. We're kind of like partners. Mm. What's that? We're like partners with the AI. Mm. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. I take it even further team. than that, yeah. where it, what it's doing is, if you look as technologies happened over time, it's allowed humanity to just lift itself and take on bigger thoughts, bigger approaches, creativity in a different way, achievements which we couldn't have done before, as you were saying. Uh, if we just look at it as a black and white, as you were saying, you know, sort of it's either good or bad, I think we'll end up missing out on how it can really uplift us in a way mm -hmm. to allow us to maybe even be more amazing. I mean, you know, humanity is incredible. Just when you think of what we've achieved, mm -hmm. can we actually see this as a way to achieve even more down the line? But in order to enable that, I think we need regulation. Oh, yeah. And well-considered regulation that has global collaboration. Because if we don't have that, like, for example, we don't have data into what's happening in China, how the abusers are using some kind of AI to generate some kind of pornographic material, or Google doesn't have access to TikTok's data. There are all these information silos that makes it really hard to even grasp the shape of the problem. So how do we even then decide what is malicious and what is not? Mm. What is our priority so that we can regulate AI so we can be partners to it? Mm. Mm. And then I suppose the arts are always under threat. So mm. it feels like if it's my book up against AI, mm. then I, I see that as a potential future and I, I think I feel threatened by that. Jesse, I'm always going to get your book over the AI. <laughs> uh, next we'll hear from Toby Walsh. And before we do, I mean, Toby's been a panellist before. He is the Chief Scientist at UNSW AI's Institute and you are actually on the government's expert panel advising on regulation. That's right. So I... you will tell them what the laws should be. <gasps> I will give them advice like the chief scientist. <laughs> tell, tell them and then it's up to them if they listen. Entirely. Okay, take away your question. Thank you. Well, we missed the boat with social media. Mm. The EU has just passed landmark regulation, AI regulation, after years of negotiations. So when are we going to have regulation in Australia? And what form should it take? OK, mm. let's mm. just touch before we go into our regulation for AI on we missing, us missing the boat with social media because, Brian Green, there's a big debate going on in your country <laughs> over actually TikTok. Yeah. Uh, how do you see that? I mean, there's a big ban, potentially, unless they divest out of China? I'm tempted to give you the same answer I did in the other question. Please don't. I won't. <laughs> Please don't. You know, you know, what makes me really uncomfortable about what's being proposed in the US Congress mm -hmm. is to single out a particular company and a particular platform as opposed to articulating principles and ideas and saying that if a given platform doesn't conform to this vision of what we want our social media to be like, then it runs afoul and we won't allow it to operate. So I, I'm really against singling out TikTok the way it's, well, it's being singled out right now. Well, it's because the Chinese yeah, government can... Yeah, of course, of yeah. course. So, so, so it's a national security Yeah, I'll understand where it's coming from, but I don't think it's the right way forward. I'm also a big free speech person. And so the way that this will disenfranchise so many people who use this as a means of getting their view out into the world or even their livelihood, it does not seem to me to be the right thing to do. OK, and we're having a debate about whether we should do it in Australia. Kathy Foley, you're one of the sort of you're you know you work for the government effectively. Uh, I provide advice to the government. That's right. <laughs> you don't want to know. you know work for them, but you are a mm -hmm. Commonwealth chief um, scientist. You're not allowed to have TikTok on your phone. No, that's right. There's a range of different things. You can't have Google, some of the Google products too. So and a, a whole range of them, and uh, and that's just because. Um, Often they have secure computers, secure phones that... Uh, Are you allowed to have Meta on your phone? Meta? I don't. No, no, no. So it's... Um, so you can see I'm having to think, thinking what's Meta. But <laughs> <laughs> just to have you uploading your, your pictures yeah, but, onto Facebook. But the thing is, even just um, document sharing, all that sort of stuff. So it's part of... Uh, 
you know, any government will want to make sure they are able to control uh, the data that, and protect themselves from cyber security. And that's mm. really an a critical baseline that you would want all governments to be uh, making sure that your information's safe, that uh, you know, governments ha have a lot of information that you do not want necessarily to be hacked in any way. OK, and, uh, Toby, I just want to go back to you, because you say we've missed the boat on social media. Do you think the current debate we're having on TikTok is trying to get back on that boat, or is it something else? I think if we wanted a proper debate, we should be debating about all the social media. We should be de Facebook Meta is, you know, provides more news than almost any other news organisation and yet denies being a news organisation. Um, and the influence that they have on elections, I think we should be very concerned Do you think about. we've missed the boat with those social media platforms now? Well, they have had a material impact upon elections. That's very clear. Mm -hmm. You can look at you know, evidence in the past. They, they've allowed, tr helped, promoted... I mean, the interesting thing is Obama was the first social media president. Mm. You know, in that case, he weaponised uh, social media for a good end, to get people out to vote, to get black people out to vote for the very first time. But those same tools now have been weaponised to prevent people from voting. And not they don't seem to be adding to our democratic discourse. They seem to be taking away. OK, so but at the heart of your question is what the, should Australia's AI regulation look like? Nadia, what should it look like? I think we have to, again, I think we need to collaborate with global entities so that we actually start to get a feel for what the problem is, because how can we have a risk-based regulation without knowing what the problem is? So getting access to that data, I think, would be really important. And then defining what is malicious and in what way. And I think the key question here also is priority. So um, I recently caught up with a um, colleague of mine who was at the UK Trust and Safety Summit. And what he said was the kind of, again, the ringing consensus um, out of all the conversations is that everybody wants and now feels the imperative need to start doing the right thing, because otherwise they might get kicked out of EU or whatever else. Mm -hmm. I know you scoffed at that, <laughs> but um, I think they are feeling, starting to feel the burn, starting to feel the fire. But I think we need to start looking at regulation as another area of innovation, not a so, limitation on tech, tech companies, because mm -hmm. I think what it's able to do now, because we got in earlier than where, where we were able to get in with social media, that we're able to go, OK, this is ma what's malicious, guys. Don't do that. This is not malicious. Do that. And actually allow them to develop in the right direction that they need to go. Jesse, do you think this is kind of a moment for us to get ahead like we haven't yeah. with social media? Mm. Yeah, I interviewed um, someone from the government, I won't say who it was, um, about a year ago about AI and asked questions. And I got to the end of the interview and went, I don't think he knows anything about AI. Mm. I thought, I doesn't know how it works, doesn't have a, a real understanding of it. That was a year ago. Maybe, maybe it's developed since then. But I, I mean, I completely agree that uh, you've got... Silicon Valley saying, please regulate us. Mm. Um, this is going to just get more and more mm. competitive. Mm. I, I worry that in terms of this is a risk, this isn't that sometimes we don't know, mm. um, but releasing something out into the world because you've got pressure from A and C mm. um, just feels like a disaster waiting to happen to me. Mm. We're really early uh, um, uh, uptake country for technology. You know, we... We, 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 we do go with, crazy for it, don't we? We, we pay mm. with our phones and our watches and you go to America and they're still relatively slow. We, we've been very rapid. <laughs> <laughs> Brian's like, well, <laughs> talk to <laughs> yourself. <laughs> Probably not in New York. Excuse but, but, me. But we, we, uh, you know, we're, we're some of the first to move on a number of technologies and yet we're kind of takers of policy in these areas. So we do have to lead. Sadly, uh, and, and I'm not a, a government basher, we, we have a great democracy, but technical leadership across leadership in Australia, writ large, not just governments, but commercial areas as well, I feel we're underdone. And I think our university colleagues probably got a lot to offer here for educating leaders to understand mm. how to lead in technology. How do you make good policy? Well, politicians are jacks of all trades and they need good advice. I really worry we've created this medium called social media through which you can inject all sorts of evil, cyber uh, threat, fraud, misinformation, largely ungoverned space. Mm -hmm. Do we need strong regulation in your view, Brian? Oh, absolutely. You do think so? Yeah. Now, if you ask me details of what no. that looks like, it's really difficult to articulate. And what the EU did, I mean, I read through, you know, the, the, the recent mm -hmm. agreement that they came to, and it, it seems sensible. But then you talk to some leaders, at least in the United States, and they say, 
it's not a partner with innovation. This is going to stifle innovation. Mm -hmm. So, you know, again, mm -hmm. as an outsider, it's hard for me to judge exactly where you draw those lines. Mm -hmm. But yes, do lines need to be drawn? Absolutely. So the lines need to be drawn. You don't want to stifle innovation. Mm. That's really tricky, though, isn't it, oh, I'm just thinking, oh, my goodness, yes. <laughs> uh, and that's why it's taking a while. It's not mm. something you do overnight. And if you think that, you've got to remember uh, generative AI and chat GPT, 20th November 2022, not that long ago. Mm. And it's had an extraordinary impact on the world, the way and rate of which it's taken over. I mean, my... my uh, Stepmother is in her late 90s, uh, late 80s, and she was asking, "Should I be worried about it?" Now, you know, that's pretty amazing when you have it impacting the general. Populace. You say it's not been that long, yeah, but actually, the technology is moving so fast that's exactly that it is right. long. Mm. It is long, but we have to get it right, as we were hearing. That if you do it in a way which stifles, then it's going to be a disadvantage for the country because it's such an important productivity measure, there's all the things we've talked about already of it being an important thing for us in Australia. So I think sometimes you do have to take a breath. It's not as though the technology's got to the point where it's the sorts of things we've heard about of the future. So we have a little bit of a runway to be able to take that time and do it properly and it bring everyone with us. It brings back to why things like elections are so important, right? We've got this big election in November in, 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 in America. I can't can foresee a situation if Mr Trump is re-elected his attitude would be, well, let's just let these American tech companies mm -hmm. off the leash and, and they will sort it out. You know, I'm not sure that's the right answer. So, so I'm kind of back to the EU starts to look like a kind of a global policy leader here. So as we, as we wonder what American leadership or kind of global unipolar leadership looked like, you know, it was a bit of this. Mm -hmm. And so now we're, chaos loves a vacuum. Mm -hmm. We might be about to have a... Chaos, chaos. loves a vacuum. Yeah. Good line. Now we have a question from David Otto. Hey, uh, given that generative AI allows students to potentially get good grades without actually learning anything, do Brian Green and the panel believe that we need to overhaul the assessment systems in our schools? And how feasible would that be? Brian Green, should we overhaul the assessment system? Well, I would say we needed to overhaul the assessment system long before AI came on the scene. So that's a whole different conversation that we'll have next week on Q&A. <laughs> uh, but, but for this week, focusing just on AI, absolutely. So in the early days, the response by many educators was to tell students you can't use these systems which is the silliest thing in the world to do for two reasons. Yeah. Number one, they're going to use it, I absolutely assure you. Mm. In fact, I know of a student at a Ivy League university mm. who got response from the teacher, from the professor, this is the best essay that has, I've ever seen, and that student confided to somebody who I'm very close with, my son, mm. that it was written by ChatGPT. Okay, mm. so it's going to happen. But the second reason is, we don't want kids to be divorced from these tools. We want them to become the experts at these tools. So the burden on the educator is change the assignments. Mm. Allow them. In fact, require that they use these systems so that they can do things that they wouldn't ordinarily be able to do. Be creative as an instructor, as a teacher, in order to cause students to become the best practitioners using these tools in the world. That's what the future is going to be. That's a really good point. Um, and a lot of schools are trying to use them as a tool now. They're Finally. trying to get on the front yes. foot. Jesse? I'm worried about what we lose as well. Uh, if you can have AI generate an essay on the Roman Empire, right, which we know it can do and it can do a relatively good job of that, the art of writing an essay, although it can be very difficult to explain why that's an important thing, it's, it's organising our thoughts and it's working out coherently how to present an argument if we can outsource that, what do we lose as a species? How do we still speak to each other? How do we develop nuance if education just becomes copy and paste? You don't copy and paste. You mm. don't outsource this. You don't give the assignment, write an essay on the Roman Empire. What's Rat the assignment? Yes, so how do you do it? How do you do it, For, for example, <laughs> paragraph one, work with ChatGPT in order to write a strong opening paragraph, say, on the Roman Empire. Then find something in your own life that ChatGPT can possibly know about that allows you to relate to it as a deep human being who's recognizing something that occurred in the past that resonates with their own life. Get paragraph two that way. And then yeah, paragraph yeah. by paragraph, 
force the student to engage in a different way. The kinds of things you'd never ask them to do without this system, but now with the system, you can have a partnership. And that's mm. the way forward. The Jesse, are you, you convinced? <sighs> Look, I sort of am. But I also, as someone who works in, in media and have watched the development of opinion writing, I'm also, I have this hesitation towards everything being about one's life and one's... That's one example. I know, I know. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, so, and... So, and, and it's a feeble example. Mm. More creative individuals than I will be able to come up with wondrous assignments that force this union to happen. And that's the burden of the educator and it's lazy educators that say to the students, don't use it, you have to stay yeah. away from yeah. it. And it's the innovative ones who will say, no, embrace it, go to a new place. Okay, just, like, I would love to see arms up if you've used chat GDP, GPT for your work at school or in your real life work. Oh! Look at all the students. Oh, busy. <laughs> you're all busy on the chat GPT, I can see. Wow, that's... It's become part of every day. Yeah. I mean, mm -hmm. it's it's mm. something which is a tool that is really helping with productivity. Mm. It's really helping wow. people to deliver on things. Okay. Do you However, use it mm. as cheap No, I, I don't use it because <laughs> we're not allowed to have it on. We're not allowed to use it here yeah. at the ABC really, too. Mm. For but our, the thing our is work. interesting, though, is if you wrote that to me, essay on, it would be probably marked with a fail. Because if you just said write an essay on on um, what was it Roman Empire Roman Empire. Mm -hmm. It would be one which would be really bland, really pathetic, and your yeah, teacher would read us saying, that's rubbish, mm. or it's got mistakes in it. What's really important, as Brian was saying, is that you've got to engage with these tools in a way that allow you to really um, take it to the next level. And I, you have to go back to, I mean, when I was in, um, first at university in the 70s, calculators came along. And we, had, we were worried that calculators were going to do the same yeah. thing, that, you know, who knows mental arithmetic these days? Or who remembers mobile phone numbers? We have our mobile phones are our brain extensions now. And if we don't realise that technologies help us then free up our brains to do other things... But are they freeing them up to do other things? Yeah, so I actually ran a tutoring agency for a long time since high school. <laughs> and so I know all about the students going on ChatGPT... Tell and me more. ..doing everything. <laughs> yeah. I can almost recognise immediately now when it's in there, say, I go, well, change that because that's ChatGPT. But also, I do have to say there are existing... Let's say the... Let's take the Australian HSC system um, as an as a example because it's convenient, it's right here. Um, there are existing forms of essays and assessments that you, it's really hard to prepare for. Like, you genuinely have to have critical thinking mm -hmm. and you have to have your own opinions to write it. For example, discursive essays. So a lot of the analytical essays, students write, they memorise it, and then they put it in yeah. within 40 minutes, change some keywords around, and that's how they do it. But with discursive essays where the questions are so random and extremely poetic and very philosophical, they can't prepare for that. So why don't we push that forward? And also, I want to give kudos to also teachers that I know from Sydney, um, Boys High School, Chatswood High School, Askham School, that um, the students at my tutoring agency has told me has already adopted methodologies to teach children yeah. to use ChatGPT in a good mm. way. For example, so one teacher does all of the... records all of her um, classes. The students learn it at, at home. They come to the classroom and that's where they do their homework. So she helps them with the progress and she simulates oh. their thinking, whatever else. Um, another um, student and um, another teacher in Chatswood High School, for example, um, has actually specifically requested students to make ChatGPT bots about the book that they are learning and chat with it, um, have a discussion about it, copy and paste the entire script, actually, and show me, and I'm going to critique how you question this bot. So there are existing teachers mm -hmm. that are doing amazing work um, in this space already, and we need to draw on their knowledge to devise the next I phase think, of education. I think that's right. And we can bring you the result of our online poll now. We asked you, the US could pass laws that would ban TikTok if its Chinese owner doesn't divest. Should we follow suit? More than 4,600 of you responded. Here's how you voted. 46% of you said yes. 40% said no. And 14% are unsure. That is one of the closest polls we've seen explaining just how difficult this issue is. <laughs> and to finish tonight's discussion, here's Kerry Croydon. How can government and the private sector help us stay safe and competent enough to continue managing our own lives 
and not be overwhelmed and bewildered by the pace and complexity of this dynamic, unavoidable online environment we have to deal with. Kerry, are you worried about anything specific? Is it scams that are being used online? Particularly scams, and I'm aware from media reports that um, our community is losing many thousands, hundreds of thousands of dollars to scammers every year. And there was an, a, a personal uh, scam attempt on me that I was exhausted by the uh, attempting scammers conversation for me to terminate the call and say I was too tired, I didn't want to talk to them anymore. But even so, by then they had uh, got me to download um, a pernicious application mm. and um, so um, it took me a long time to sort out all my affairs um, after that. And that's... Brian, this is a big thing around the world. Scammers are really uh, monetising yeah. and are basically exploiting AI mm. and... That's a big conundrum and it's yeah. growing. But again, even before AI, you know, we have a it's non-profit easier for them, we have a non-profit company in the United States. We got hit really? with one of these, you know, CEO scams where you get an email mm. Friday at like 4.50, mm. supposedly from the CEO saying you need to wire $150,000 by five o'clock or we're gonna lose this thing that we need. And so the person quickly wires the money and it wasn't from the CEO. It was from somebody else. And so, yes, these things are happening, and it is mm -hmm. devastating when it happens. And what's the answer? I don't know. I just wish people were better. But one quick answer is just disconnect. Mm -hmm. The moment they call, just hang up. The moment they send you an email, just hit delete. <laughs> just don't go near any of it. <laughs> you know. I think, though, that they're, mm -hmm. they're getting smarter and smarter. I have a, a, my grandfather, who's um, 96, and he uh, was hit and lost an enormous amount of money by a scam and ended up in front of a bank teller, and when she looked at his account, she just burst out into tears and went, I can't believe what, what I'm seeing here. And my anger in that situation went to certain banks, certain institutions, certain phone companies, and I was going... This is also on you. Like, if someone is pretending to be you mm. and is sending me emails and text messages constantly, I consider myself pretty literate and I've been pretty close a few times to, to being scammed. Mm. And I must say that in the last six months I've seen a real improvement. I think it is on those private companies to, to educate people and not just on the places where, you know, 20-year-olds are. It's got to be traditional media as well, where my 96-year-old grandfather is too. Mm. Yeah, that's a heartbreaking story and there's so mm. many people who are in that situation. And a wider range of age groups, I've got to say. It's not just no, older yeah. Australians. Mm. No, right. Absolutely. Mm. Um, Nadia, yeah. final word to you. That's part of the kind of mm. online conversation we need to be having at mm. a kind of deeper level, right? Yeah, definitely. Um, and that's what we're trying to build at That's My Face. But I think, I'm so sorry that happened to you. That's literally, the stories like yours is why I started building this company. It really upsets me when I think about it. Because we can be better. We can be better, but we're just not being. Because um, the big tech companies don't have the regulation, the imperative need to make a change. Um, they can do it, but they're not doing it. Mm. So I'm trying to do something, but it's hard. But I think everybody on this table and the ethics centre and the regulator, fancy glasses person. <laughs> <laughs> um, I think we Tony owe Walsh, it. she does have good glasses. Yeah, but <laughs> I think we owe it to you. And we owe it to everyone to build, build a better world. We do. And can I say, I do not think an AI panel would have been better than you, your real selves. <laughs> <laughs> your real breathing selves. That's all we have time for. Thanks to our panel, Nadia Lee, Gus McLaughlin, Brian Green, Kathy Foley and Jesse Stevens. <clears throat> Thank you for sharing your stories and your questions. Next week, I'll be with you live from Melbourne for a special Q&A on the housing crisis. The panel will include Andrew Bragg, Max Chandler, Mather, 